One of the greatest things about anime that really stands out to me is the ability to turn seemingly mundane things that are part of the normal human experience into something magical, epic, or just hilariously intriguing. Two young people falling in love? That's obviously a war! A battle of wits as both sides struggle with the impossibility of wanting to be close to someone yet not vulnerable to the other, and as the war of love rages on, it becomes not about disarming the other out of fear of getting hurt, but disarming yourself because only when you are willing to make yourself vulnerable by taking a risk and putting yourself out there to another person do you truly love them, which is why you must be careful with who you love and what you love about them. Oh, a young couple getting married? Well, obviously there is a mystery to be uncovered that only close intimacy of the loving relationship can reveal over time, as one realizes how literally supernatural marriage can really be. Oh, what's that? Now it's time to move on to starting a family? It's the only way to save the world! The delicate stability of civilized society hinges on your ability to find a wife, raise a child, and make said child educated and capable of contributing to society as much as possible, otherwise the very fabric of civilization will be torn apart, humans will turn into ravaging wolves, and children will languish in the trauma of the wilderness just beyond the thin veil of polite society. So you must start a family, Agent Anon. But be careful, to navigate the hidden secrets of those around you, even your wife and child will have a secrets you must navigate. And don't get me started on family baggage like incestuous brother-in-laws, part of the secret police! And what's hilarious is that all of this is true, all of it. From young love being a challenge that can leave you devastated if you're not careful, to marriage being a possible supernatural experience if you're lucky, to family being the main thing preventing society from collapsing into anarchy. But we never think about these things in such terms as they get lost in the banal drudgery of normie life. But in reality, all of us are going through our own epic adventure in one way or another. And stories have a brilliant way of shining a light on the extraordinary aspects of ordinary life, which end up reminding us of our grandiose purpose and why we carry on in our everyday lives. Thus, by doing so, they can help to make life either magical, an adventure, or at least less banal. Which is what Spy X Family does, and why there's a kernel of truth to the joke that this show was state-sponsored pro-family propaganda derived from the cabinet of the late Shinzo Abe. But if it's true, they are very subtle about it. You can barely sense it when you watch it. She has to be some kind of spy who was sent here for the sole purpose of lowering our country's birth rate or something crazy like that. This is subliminal message to anime to save Japan. Make many babies, space cowboy. But yeah, the fact that Japan has a baby deficit crisis that will affect its ability to provide public services to its aging population and thus the entire system might collapse means that Spy X Family is absolutely right in its wholesome narrative of how starting a family is a heroic act that just might save the world. How? Well, only one way to find out! Video essay! <laughs> By the way, from now on, I'll just call it Spy Family instead of Spy X Family for the sake of convenience. So in the fictional geopolitics of Spy Family, we visit two European-like countries caught in a tense Cold War called Westalis and Ostalis, which is an obvious Berlin Wall situation type reference. Because Japan is obsessed with Germany. And no, it's not because of their alliance with Mustache Man in World War II, but because Japan modeled itself after Prussia, and drew from their political and military theories back in the day when Japan was still modernizing. So Japan feels a natural kinship and fascination with German history and culture, as we see in basically every single anime with a European or European-like setting. Anyway, the world in Spy Family is one on the edge of the abyss, as extremely high tensions can easily lead to another devastating war due to certain political demagogues in high positions of power, doing their best to make it happen for ideological reasons. It's because of this that the protagonist, a dashing heroic spy named Twilight, who infiltrated the enemy nation crawling with secret police thugs just itching to capture him, is ordered on a mission to start a local family to then put a kid into an elite school that educates the next generation of elites of this enemy nation just so that he can position himself socially to get access to one of the parents who is the most dangerous political figures and the man most pushing for war. To do this, Twilight adopts an adorable little creep called Anya! We love Anya! Who is a human experimented on by military science. 
so she can read minds and melt our hearts. However, no one really knows of her secret powers, except maybe the dog, who can see the future? Yeah, don't ask. Agent Twilight also hastily marries a lady named Yor, a modern career woman who mostly preferred to be single in order to focus on her secret job as an assassin for hire, though she does work in an office as a cover. And after creating this weird, awkward family, all of whom have dangerous secrets from each other, Twilight can then infiltrate high society and exert influence upon it to then hopefully achieve world peace. From the outset of the story, Spy Family is all about fighting chaos and animosity by building human connections, of which family is the most important one. But through it, you connect to others outside your family and form a larger network that can then bridge gaps. Peace through community. And this clever little narrative comments on deeper themes of family and the relationship between a modern man, his wife, and their child. The child being the main reason why either the sexes get married in the first place. It's why marriage as an institution exists, after all. It's not really meant for companionship as it is now, but anyway. The more I analyze the story, the more it seems like Spy Family explores the dynamic of the modern couple somewhat allegorically but does so in holistic fashion, portraying the contradictions, duplicitousness, and wholesome aspects of both genders in modern times. Basically, the story displays in exaggerated form the game that men and women play with each other these days. Twilight is a man driven by a sense of purpose and discovers family as a means of achieving something greater than himself alone, a legacy of sorts, which for him as a character would be a world at peace. Even if he'll personally be forgotten, his legacy will outlive him as something he helped build. While on the other hand, Yor is driven by a need for stability. She's been capable and independent for very long, but age is starting to catch up with her. And the older she gets, the more things get uncertain and she seeks marriage as a means to protect herself. And in her case, it's from the predatory forces of the secret police that views socially atomized people as suspicious and possible spies. Not a place for the fem cells and the incels, I can tell you that. And these are typically the general practical differences of why men and women seek marriage in the modern era. There are exceptions, of course, and there are also more romantic reasons why men get married. But it's interesting how Spy Family deals with the practical sides of marriage as a necessity and seeks to embellish pragmatic relationships with the extraordinary by seeing it as a means to save society and nothing to be ashamed of, rather than play up the romantic aspect of marriage as something magical. Just get married to save the pension system from collapse! Love can come later! Twilight, as the protagonist, is very much demonstrating the average male experience. Especially in Japan, I imagine. While he gets caught up in his career, giving up his entire life for his job, and sacrificing personal connections and happiness until it's revealed that it all means nothing unless he has a family, and that it's by fulfilling his role and service to said family is how he will do the most important job of all. But his character also shows the darker aspect of the modern man, since Twilight is a bit of a two-faced guy, pretending he's someone he's not, often using women as a means to an end, pretending to care about them to create feelings in them, which he can then use to manipulate them for his objectives and turn them into cam girls or something. <laughs> I'm j it's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke. It's just the way that how, it's just, you know, it's, it's the game that modern people play with each other, from both sexes. And case in point, Yor is the archetypal modern middle-class marriage-age woman of today, who is independent and beautiful and being an assassin who prowls the night, accumulating a literal body count while dressed up like this. Oh my, so risque. And holding a suspiciously shaped object that would give good old Freud the tingles. <laughs> assassin is a fitting metaphor for being a man-eater. Oh, here she comes. Watch out, boy, she'll chew you up going around breaking hearts in her youth, which is coming to an end, and as independent as she is, things eventually catch up with her, which is why she's at the age where she must settle down, or be trampled by the impersonal forces of the world. So she goes out and looks for a husband. Compared to Twilight, yours motivation for marriage as a means for stability might seem more selfish, but in reality, the reason why Yor becomes so caught up in her job was a way to care for her brother and to survive in a system that neglects her needs for human connection. She is an unfortunate pawn of uncaring forces, but through her connection to Twilight and Anya, she rediscovers her feminine maternal role and finds fulfillment. 
And then you have the other aspects of family life that we see manifest in hilarious ways in the show but within this wacky adventurous animated scenario. The fact that this fake family called the Forger family, oh I get it, haha, <laughs> is made up of a spy, an assassin, a mini telepath, all of whom have secrets they keep from each other, is pretty true to how real families are despite it not being healthy. But even the most stable and loving families keep some secrets from each other, even if not forever. Anya, being a secret mind reader, is reminiscent to how kids can be more aware of things than adults typically give them credit for. It's just that kids don't always understand what they are perceiving. And you also have the smaller things that the average middle class family typically deals with that the show exposes in wacky anime fashion. Like Twilight having a female colleague who's a homewrecker in love with him and wants to split him up with Yor. Also, most of Twilight's adventures and mission revolves around keeping up the appearance of the model family to his neighbors, balancing a precarious social circle that involves keeping a psycho brother-in-law and the Stasi from catching his scent, but most importantly, it revolves around school, making Anya excel in her classes, while also keeping her happy and balancing her obligations as a student with the needs of her childhood. This being the absolutely most crucial part of his mission, which will determine its success. Everything Twilight has achieved, his esteemed career, marrying a beautiful woman, is all for nothing compared to this singular goal. In fact, marrying a woman was done for this purpose. It's about raising the next generation, not just having little Anya around, but making sure she thrives. And Spy Family explores how the future of nations are molded by the nation itself through its educational institutions, but also the family structure itself and how it works. Also, here's a question. What's the difference between education and brainwashing? I mean, they're identical, right? In practice, at what they do to a person's mind, especially children. Repeat after me. Think this way. These are the values you should have, etc. However, the crucial key difference is the intention and purpose of why you're molding a person's mind and influencing their thoughts and behavior. Education is when you shape the mind of a person for their benefit, because what you're molding them into is better for their life than what they are now. You are making them stronger and smarter and more capable of handling themselves in a harsh world. You're making them into something more. A good sign of education is when you educate someone to be even better and smarter and stronger than you are, which is what loving parents are supposed to do. While brainwashing is when you mold the person to get something out of them, to their detriment. It's a parasitic process where you make them weaker than you so you can remain in control. Like telling people not to form families and just focus on their jobs so they remain divided, while the elites all have like four plus kids. The truth is these educational institutions are so important because of the vast majority of humans seek a path of least resistance, and they take the shape of these structures around them. The same way Anya wishes to just watch TV, play games and mess around all day instead of studying and training her mind, so if there's no one to push her, no structure to shape her into something so elegant, she'll atrophy into an amorphous blob of a couch potato. No good to anyone, not even herself. And the first institution that provides the necessary pushback that she needs to be the best version of herself is her family. Her father and mother providing that structure in a hierarchical environment while also giving Anya examples of good behavior in their own conduct, which is what wealthy people benefit from, that structure. Spy Family demonstrates how it takes an absurd amount of effort to rise to the top and to have your family remain at the top throughout the generations. Yes, there are historical moments when elites become useless hedonists who party all the time, but that's only true for dying elites about to be replaced one way or another by a new elite who are masters of discipline and who are excellent at what they do, which is why they're so good at fighting off competition. And competition is very much the definitive aspect of an elite, which is why Anya's storyline is all about her entering an elite circle of students by winning a type of competition and becoming an elite scholar with all the golden medals. Just so that Twilight will have the social context necessary to meet his target, 
the father of Anya's classmate, who is himself a master of harsh excellence, so disciplined that not only is he a powerful patriarch of a political dynasty, but he's impossible to reach in any other way, never straying from highly calculated environments that he controls, precisely to protect himself from assassinations. And I mean real ones, not Freudian metaphors for promiscuity. <laughs> Though assassination doesn't appear to be what Twilight is after, at least for now. Instead, his mission appears to be about forming a connection with his enemy, which will give Twilight much needed intelligence and influence. And when Twilight finally does meet his mark, the enigmatic Donovan, Desmond, he realizes that the man's harshness and coldness to his own son is connected to the character traits that make him into a warmonger. Yes, excellence, discipline, and elegance are important and make us able to achieve great things, but they all mean nothing without a genuine human connection and people you love being the reason to achieve great things for. We do it for them. Spy Family is a show that explores the idea of a fake family, a facade, if you will, that you hold up in order to achieve social acceptance. And Twilight's fake family that he built with Yor ends up having more potential to become a real one as genuine feelings of love between the three of them start to blossom than what's currently present in Donovan's biological family, where love is missing and the family is really just a means to a vain end, a political structure for mere dynastic purposes. So in the end, the Desmond family, not the Forger family, are the actual fake family determined solely by social conventions. The titular spy family of our main characters is of course also a means to an end, as every family is to some extent, and it definitely started for pragmatic reasons. Twilight needed to fulfill his purpose, Yor needed security, and Anya needed care. But a true family moves beyond that. When the people themselves become your purpose, your security, and what you care about, it's not just a means to fulfill a social role, but a higher purpose than that. A means to build a community of love, one better than society, warmer and kinder. And society itself needs genuine families. Society pushes us to start families not because families are a mere social construct, but because society is composed of families. Society began as the family structure in the origin of our species, when we were naked people walking around among the tall grass. And the stronger the family bonds, the stronger the society and the more chaos is held at bay. But forming these connections requires sacrifice and denying some of your own needs to make room for the needs of the other person and focus on them. And when everyone does this, ironically, everyone's needs are met. The problem is when relationship becomes parasitic and people focus on what they want from a family as opposed to what they wish to give. That's how you get toxic family members, which is always a danger when you enter a relationship and that's why it also takes courage to expose yourself to others, who might want to take advantage of your genuine need for a connection. And with family being the most intense and vulnerable connection you can make with somebody, because the closer they are, the more they can hurt you, and family also being so necessary for the well-being of society, the willingness to go out and make your own family becomes an act of heroism, because the risk is massive. You might marry the wrong person, or you might raise a psycho monster. In our day and age, divorce rates are through the roof, financial stability is declining, and the real world is at the edge of an abyss, as the legacy of the Cold War, the era explored in Spy Family, has returned with a vengeance. But most importantly for the anime is that massive birth rate decline and the decline of marriage, along with the rise of childless single people as a massive societal demographic, threatens to crash the entire modern system. You think it's hyperbole? Well, it isn't. The retirement crisis. It's explosive. It's igniting tensions and threatening to upend the way our societies are organized. It's leading to some outrageous suggestions and causing fury. And the root cause? Demographic decline. So more economic burden is falling on a shrinking group of working adults. The social contract will be rewritten. Governments have failed to prevent holes in our pension system. That means it will fall on people to take personal responsibility for their post-work lives with their own savings. When even German state media is talking about rewriting the social contract and that pensions will be a private matter for you to handle with your family and that societal and economic collapse is inevitable on some level, then you know times are getting interesting. 
and lower birth rates are already crashing the system worldwide, especially in Japan, which is desperate for children, and even has the government questioning if it will continue to exist. The Prime Minister of Japan literally said that society will stop functioning if they don't solve the birth rate crisis immediately. But they're not making any progress as they keep breaking their own record in low birth rates. Fewer workers means less people supporting you when you're 80 years old, which means Trudeau will euthanize your silly, wrinkly ass when you're at your most vulnerable age, just to cut costs. I mean, we're probably screwed unless we discover de-aging eternal youth technology, which might happen. I'd be surprised if we did though, to be honest. Don't hold your breath for that. But you guys know what this means, right? It's the failure of the modern system, the arrival of a new era with new values, most likely a return to families and local communities, as the state will no longer be able to provide services for most of us. And we're probably going to see things hit the fan very soon. And that's the thing, government doesn't really care about us. A friend of mine who's a European lawyer says that most of his job is suing his own government to cough up pension money for citizens that they promised but are dragging their heels more and more. And in England, a lot of welfare money is drying up fast, apparently. Society is eroding. The UK's welfare system is collapsing. Family benefits have been cut by 50% in the last decade. The worsening situation is also affecting the middle classes. The government appears useless. Yeah, if you're my age, you ain't seeing any retirement money yet. Just resign yourself to that. And I'm not convinced AI will save us either. Maybe, but who knows? But that's a topic for another video. But why do we have a fertility crisis with not enough people being born? Is it because of the fertility crisis that we will face imminent hard times and economic ruin, or is it because we are sliding into economic ruin that we stopped having children? It's a bit of both, of course, a kind of vicious cycle we tumbled into as we roll all the way down to a new harsher era. When asked, cost of living is way up there as a reason given for why millennials and Gen Z don't want children. But so is personal freedom, wanting some me time, and wanting to find myself and other silly nonsense like that. Though, to me, cost of living does seem to be a bit of a cop-out in my honest opinion. The highest birth rates are in the poorest countries on earth, and even in rich countries, it's the poor having most of the kids on average. And even when governments give financial incentives, the birth rates in rich countries don't seem to be going up that much. Clearly, if you wanted kids, we could have them. Now, I do know that the cost of education is going up, and it's about the quality of life and opportunities that people are afraid to not be able to give to their kids. But even that is a misconception. Costs are up for middle class families who are being hollowed out, but we could solve this by changing how the middle class functions and cut extra costs for more cost effective methods of higher education, for instance, instead of going to these massive adult daycares with fetish clubs and game rooms and swimming pools or whatever. Many of the world's billionaires are college dropouts anyway, and there are more affordable trade schools giving decently paying job opportunities these days. And those are the jobs that are in higher demand going forward. I do think selfishness is a major reason for the birth rate crisis, even if not the main one. We do live in a spoiled, self-centered culture, and are constantly bombarded with the idea to live our best lives, which may or may not include us contributing to society in any meaningful way, but it's probably not the only reason. I think even more devastating than a selfish culture is the current mismatching between men and women, where even people who want to settle down and have kids never seem to find the right partner, and if they do, it's not the right time. Our modern or postmodern society has no cultural mechanism to help young men and women meet, like local festivals with dancing and cotton candy where they can find each other and have fun in a wholesome way. Ironically, over-sexualizing the gender dynamic after the sexual revolution has made it more difficult to form actual relationships, not less since everything is transactional now. The increasing distrust between the sexes isn't helping either when we have entire political movements on both sides dedicated to blaming and dehumanizing the other half of the human race. Also, the way that jobs and careers function and how our life cycles are means that we spend most of our youth working as wage slaves to, you know, mindless corporations and government jobs, and we're not given much time or space to go out and form communal bonds, and that I think is a major reason as well. Which is why I do think that we need to rethink how we function as a society, how we balance communal life and work life, and how the genders interact with each other. And it's exactly in this context that we do see a return to the idealization of family life where childless YouTubers of either sex glamorize making babies as the answer to fulfillment while not making significant effort to get married themselves, and live out the fantasy that they're selling to their audience. 
red pill bros with their harems or side chicks and childless female podcasters talking of the glories of traditional family life come to mind. And I know what you might be thinking. Am I, Pilgrim, a part of that? I have no children at 30, though not for lack of trying. I had to break up with the love of my life a few months ago, the woman I thought I was going to marry and have kids with, because like I said, it's not about only finding the right person, but the right time, and reality wouldn't let us continue. So I'm aware of the situation that we millennials and zoomers are all in. But when I talk about having kids and starting a family, I'm not saying it's easy or trying to sell you a fantasy about making love in wheat fields and then popping out little baby angels who will make your life easier and pay for your healthcare bills. On the contrary, I'm saying it's a heroic act precisely because of how difficult it is and how much courage it takes and that it's a lifelong endeavor and it's not going to make you happier. You're going to suffer whether you live life for yourself or for others. But in the latter situation, you have more happiness to share among those you love. That at least is something. And we should not start a family and have kids just to create little taxable worker drones for the very apathetic governments who caused this mess in the first place. Or even to be our future slaves for our personal retirement pensions. And it's not only about biological families anyway, as Spy Family points out. There are many types of families that exist. A young woman who joins a convent to become a nun, or a young man who enters a monastery, they do find their families in spiritual covenants. And some people really do have the life calling to find fulfillment in their jobs and careers. and might not have time to start a family, which they have no interest in, but they still become extremely useful to society and fulfilled by dedicating themselves entirely to their careers. And they find their family among their work colleagues. This does happen, but I'm not sure how common it is to form a family bond with your boss or Jared from accounting. But yeah, I do know that we're all not meant to have biological children and live the family life. Some of us have different callings, different vocations. Only you know what your purpose in life is. I suppose the key to saving the world from chaos is not about popping out babies exactly, but for more people to be motivated by altruism rather than parasitic selfishness. Just as not wanting to have kids yourself because you want to vacay in the Bahamas and drink champagnes in the evenings with your pet Siberian tiger while still demanding universal health care and retirement pensions for yourself that other people's kids are going to have to pay for your old age is wrong. It's wrong, and I see many people doing this. It's also wrong to want to have kids and dominate over their lives exclusively for your benefit and your sense of legacy and stuff like that as they are farmed and bred like animals. However, I am a firm believer that whether or not we have biological kids, we are all meant to take a fatherly or motherly role at some point in our lives, where our gathered life wisdom is meant to be paid forward to younger generations, whether a co-worker, a student, a friend, etc. Not in a patronizing way, and not that they should be bossed around and told what to do just because they're younger, but if they need someone older to rely on, then we should be there. I suppose that if we decided on whether or not to be single or career focused or start a family, should be based on what we're best suited for, and if either decision is the best way for us to contribute to society based on our circumstances and abilities, and where we are at in life, then people will figure out for themselves the best way that they can contribute. Provided we are all motivated by altruism. People's freedom to choose isn't the issue. The issue is if they are choosing to help out in general, not how they choose to help out. It's not about living your best life. It's about being your best in your life and the lives of others. Humanity as a whole benefits from forming real relationships and a family. Because humanity is a relationship. Humanity is a family. Humanity is in essence more than one person in communion. Humanity is not atomized individuals, but merely made up by us. Which makes sense for me as a Catholic, because God is a family with a father and a son. God is a relationship. God is a communion. Of course, that's just my personal belief. You do you, bro. But we can think in scientific terms too. Every individual is made up of half the DNA from two people. We carry them in our flesh and blood. We are birthed through a human connection. We are a human connection between two people. Therefore, it's through the family that we can save human civilization by growing and nurturing future generations. Because it's through the family that we affirm what it means to be human, not through our separated dead individuality which is incapable of perpetuating humanity into the future. Now I'm not advocating for a hive mind mentality here. Individuality is important for individual choices because a true family is based on a voluntary connection between people. That's how children should be born. 
When they're born via force connection, that's not a family, it's an abomination. But with all this being said, I didn't just get political for no reason. I actually had a point about the anime. Because what I absolutely love about Spy Family, it's the way it paints family building as an epic adventure coupled with the fact about how difficult and challenging building a family in the real world is becoming. We are reminded, through great and wacky zany storytelling about telepathic little weirdos and psychic dogs and an odd couple with secret lives, that although most of us in our real lives can't go on blood-chilling military expeditions to save humanity from extinction, or be front and center in a great civilizational clash, or discover arcane magic powers and overthrow a secret tyrant controlling society in the shadows, most of us can experience our own epic family building adventures, which is just as essential for humanity and just as heroic and actually quite the adventure. If nothing else, it's an adventure to navigate the complexities of a cruel world that is barely civilized, where you must navigate secrets and social intricacies while doing our best to give the best possible life to tiny people. And it does make us the heroes to those adorable little monsters if we successfully pull it off and give it our best shot. Seeing something we normally think of as being so banal in this extraordinary way and realizing that this extraordinary perspective is still true is interesting, at least to me. And this is something we shouldn't forget, that all good parents are in fact heroes. So that concludes my talk for today. Thank you patrons for everything. The term Patreon itself has interesting etymological roots related to the topic of this video because I rely on your support, and for that I am most grateful. But I'm not going to call you Daddy Patrons because that would make it weird. And if the rest of you like stories on found families, I recommend the web series Call of the Arbiter here on YouTube. Check this out. What are you doing? Making a choice. Cool, huh? Want to see how it ends? Go watch it, it's free. It's from Raid Shadow Legends. No, don't roll your eyes just because it's a sponsored bit. It's actually a good series about good people from all races uniting to fight the corruption in the world. And it has some really good themes on family through moral bonds, where the right thing unites people. I really recommend it. I'll leave a link for the first episode in the description, as well as the link for the game. And I'll also put it in the pinned comment. Thank you all for listening to my ramblings. Have a good day, my friends.